Did everybody get signed in? If you haven't signed in after class, uh, or after the, after the presentation, make sure you come on over and uh, get signed in on the sheets here if, you're, uh, uh, if you need to do this for your, for your class as well. Uh, my name is Bob Hicks. I'm the Development Director for the Montford College of Business, and it's great to see such a uh, fantastic turnout. Hope everybody's holidays were great and uh, you enjoyed a little break. I'm um, here to introduce our uh, speaker. Uh, Eric Chester has spent the, uh, his entire career helping people figure out the transition of school to work to career. Over the past 12 years, he's been the keynote speaker and consultant to more than 150 top companies and organizations that rely heavily on young adults as their emerging workforce. He's a proud UNC alum, go Bears. Mr. Chester returns to campus to share how to get from here to there, even if you don't know where there is. Eric's client list includes Dairy Queen, Harley Davidson, Wells Fargo, and Toys R Us. He has frequently appeared on national media such as Good Morning America, MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, and ABC News 2020. He's author of numerous books, including his latest book, Reviving Work Ethic, which was just released this month. So let's give a big bear welcome to Eric Chester. Can y'all hear me okay? <clears throat> Can you see me okay? Can you see me okay? Can you see me? Can you see me? Did you really see me? Were you really looking? Did you see me? Did you see me right there? Did you see me? Look a little closer. Did you see me? I want you to see something. Did you see like here? Like, you see? Look inside. Do you see what you see? Hair. You can have that to see me. Hair growing out of my ears. Now this is weird because last time I was here, there was no hair in my ears. When I was here, it was 32 and a half years ago when I last set foot in Kepner Hall. And there was no hair on my ears. You know what that proves? I'm not just getting older. I'm old. I'm old. And then you know it's freaking me out because I'm thinking as I come here today, how old is it old? How many times have, did I have the lecture back when I was your age from people who said, it goes by just like that? I heard those what? It leads me on. So I'm on this flight. It's from Chicago to Dayton. And my laptop battery is dead. And so I pull out one of those little in-flight magazines that are in the seat back pocket right in front of you. And I begin reading it just for my own amusement. And it, the story I'm reading turns out to be about dendrochronologists. Do you know what a dendrochronologist is? A scientist who makes their living studying the age of trees. Talk about people who took a long turn on career. <laughs> Turns out that dendrochronologists had a convention. True. Three years ago, an international association of dendrochronologists had a meeting and they walked away with a scientific conclusion, something that rarely happens in the scientific community. A conclusion. It seems like they all agree that the world's oldest trees are actually right here in North America. Throughout California, Death Valley, Great Basin, White Mountain Range, there are these bristle cone pine trees. And they believe that those bristle cone pine trees are 4,000 years of age and older. In fact, if you ever get out. If you ever get out to California, Death Valley, Great Basin, White Mountain Range, go trip around looking at all these trees, you're going to find one tree that has a plaque by it that these dendrochronologists have named Methuselah. Because dendrochronologists around the world believe that Methuselah is the world's oldest tree, 4,652 years of age. And if that doesn't freak you out, maybe this will. Methuselah is still alive and growing. Okay, maybe it didn't freak you out. Unless, of course, you know, look at your own life there. Do you have 4,652 years? So would you trade your life for the life of Methuselah? Methuselah? Would you trade just one year? One year of your life to live the entire life of Methuselah? No, he has no tables. You know why? Because you don't want quantity. You want to quality of life. That's the one thing that binds us together. We want quality of life. How long will that be? Well, I'm here to tell you, someday you're going to have hair in your ears. And that someday, you're going to die. Isn't that what you love to hear from the motivational speaker? It's true, you're going to die. They're going to put you into the 
cry out with a shovel. Turn it on your face and go back to some church and eat the tea. Scummy! And you don't know it. That's the worst thing. Nobody really knows. So it was Y2K. Put yourself back there if you can remember Y2K. Remember the hysteria? Everybody was freaking out about Y2K because they didn't know whether or not all the computers were going to be reset. Nobody knew exactly what was going to happen because of this Y2K virus. They didn't know when the computers went from 1999 to the year 2000, whether or not the computers were, that, 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 that house on power grid, that, 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 that run the stock market, that really control the entire universe force. Nobody knew what was going to happen come the year 2000. And people were really capitalizing on this hysteria, especially this retailer you may have heard of, Walmart. Because Walmart was selling a millennial clock. Now, a millennial clock was simply a clock that counted down the days, the hours, the minutes, and the seconds to the new millennium. <coughs> I was there with my 12 year old daughter. We were strolling through Walmart, and here's this big group of people in Walmart, all looking at the <coughs> millennial clock. And Whitney asked me a question. Sometimes kids ask their parents. Noticing this millennial clock, and people just kind of What's going to happen? Didn't know if there was going to be brown, brownouts, rolling power surges, whether there was going to be a big hand from heaven that reached down through and wiped out humanity, and what happened? No. Nobody did. So Whitney says, Dad, how much time do I have? It's a weird question. How much time? I didn't know. So I did what most parents do when they don't know when they're asked a question. Maybe something <laughs> But then I did some research. Turns out people my age, baby boomers, people who have hair in their ears, our life expectancy here in America, about 75 years. A little older for women, a little less for men. 75 years, give or take. Your generation is still little longer. Do it advances in science and technology, maybe it's different, maybe it's healthier, I don't know. But it's predicted that your generation is going to live up to five years longer. That's what actuaries, people who study, study human mentality, believe. Your generation is going five years longer than my generation. Eight years. But when I presented that a couple of days later to Whitney, 80, probably somewhere around that, she had no conception of eight years. Do you? There's no clock that measures eight years. There's no calendar that measures eight years. I had to create some kind of a metaphor for Whitney. And I found it out of my board bench in my garage. I found this. This is an Empire 6230 tape measure. See, this is a tape. And this is the way I reason. See, every foot on this tape measure has 12 inches. And every year of our life has 12 months. So I figured if you stretched it out, you could then see what 80 years look like if every foot represented one year. So we stretched out the driveway. Maybe you with your help, we'll stretch it out in here. Kind of a volunteer. Somebody just help me. Not that big a deal. I'm not going to ask you to speak or sing a song or tell a joke. Great. Would you come up to the front please? Fantastic. <coughs> All right. And your name is? Thomas. Thomas, that is correct. Come up here. <laughs> Thomas, um, like you, all these people in this room were born. They were born like they were hatched. They were born. So I want you to take, take Thomas, I want you to take this tape measure. You're going to represent birth, and I want you to go stand by that door. Birth is zero. It's the moment we all take our first breath, gain our existence, that's going to represent birth. Of course, we have to stretch this out, and so I need a grand labor. Somebody else. You would do a great job. You would do a Awesome. Awesome. Grand labor is always come from the last one. I don't know what it is. It's just, just the way it is. And you might have to hold your arm up close. And your name is? Megan. Megan. Nice to meet you. Come on up. Megan, I want you to take this team measure. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Megan. How old did we say everyone in this room, for purposes of just demonstration today, is going to live? Eighty years. And on this team measure, it's not eighty years; it's eighty feet. Oh, right. So this is not twenty-two years. This is twenty-two. Yes. Right. Right, twenty-two years. Twenty-two years. Right. So what I want you to do is I want you to find eight. Now we can't do that because of physics. So what we're going to do is we're going to bend it. And this uh, young lady has offered to hold, hold up her hand or whatever, so we can bend it to the, and see how far if we can even get to 80 in here, so if you would, please, uh, yeah, just, if you'll just hold your finger right here and let's see if Megan can 
take it and how far she can actually stretch this bad boy out. Um, if she goes by you and she needs to bend it, just kind of help her. So uh, where are you right now, Megan, for example? Oh, okay, we got a long way to go. We might have to wrap it around. Where are you right now, Megan? 62. Ooh, keep going. End it. There you go. Keep going. Where are you? 70. Going, going, wow. All these twists and turns. Life is like that sometimes. You know, if we had a gymnasium court, it would be just simple, but here we are. This is 80. This is 80. So, if you would, just for a second, take yourself out of the picture, or out of the frame where you can see the picture, the picture that your life is. Right now, this is what it represents, this tape measure. If you have 80 years, and I know there's some people in here who are going to live long past 80. You'll be 126 years of age, you'll be back to your 80th birthday. Also. I was just a kid back then. <laughs> but we know that not everyone in here is going to live to 80. 80 is just a guess. Don't get too weaked out about it. So that means where are you right now? I'm going to assume that there is nobody younger than 18 in here. Am I wrong? Is there anyone less than 18 in this room? So is there anybody in here that's 18 years of age? Is there anybody in here right now that's 18? Oh, you would do a great job. Come on to the front, please. Fantastic, 18. Love it. All right. And your name is? Austin. Austin, come on up. I've been to your city. <laughs> All right, Austin, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your right hand, I want you to stick it underneath here. And you said you were 18, so I'm going to assume that last year you were in high school, right? Yeah. All right, so we're going to find out the first 18 years. I want you to go ahead and stand by the 18, if you will. So just take your right hand and keep moving it underneath until you get to the right 18. Okay, now. We can assume that everybody in here has had these experiences. They haven't all been the same, but they've been some similarities. Am I right? I mean, flashback, you're a little kid, brains all mushy, sit down watching television, sitting in the living room, maybe you're five or six years of age, mom, dad come into the living room, they scoop you up, they put you in the back of a minivan, and they dump you off in front of some big building. Do you remember that day? Did you ever ask to go to school? No, you didn't solicit your input, did you? You were dumped off. You walked inside with your first grade teacher. Went, Five, six, you kid. All of a sudden you're in this big building. They walk inside with what? You came inside with a little zipper bag, or, you know, with pencils, crayons, how much glue, just a bunch of stuff. And all of a sudden there's this lady barking out orders. What's that sound? Your bells down, shh, don't say anything. Take the next hour, which means it's time for recess, go outside and play. Take the next hour, which means recess, go back to class, be ready to go to work. Take the next hour, which means it's lunch time. Grab your little lunch box, set up in the cafeteria, take the next hour, recess, or lunch is over, go back to class. Take the next hour, after your recess, go outside and play. Take the next hour, which means recess is over, go back to class. Take the next hour, which means school is over, go home. Think about it. You get programmed as a little kid, and you go through what the next 12 years. Responding to bells. Most of you right now, you're done. What would you do? Stop moving. It's being ingrained in you. You get a hold of it. Primary grades, somewhere in here, you're out playing with your friends. You're in a playground. You look across the playground, you see that group of friends, and somebody over there looks at you that you feel funny inside. And you're thinking to yourself, do they feel funny inside when I look at them? But you can just go up and ask them. So what do you do? Think about it. You sleep in a love note. Remember the love notes? Communication took on a whole new meaning. You wrote one of those things, you wrote yes and no boxes all the way down. I like you, do you like me? Big box yes, no box no. Now we get into our first business problem. It's a distribution problem. How are you going to get this note into their hands? Guys, it would look like a paper airplane, a fluid, or not into the ball and just in the head with it. <laughs> Girls, know what you did? You folded it into 187,000 different directions and turned it into origami. Do you like me, yes or no? Girls, still laugh. <laughs> Guys looking at me like an officer, it's the best part. <laughs> How do we do that? Guys, don't think about it. Just look at things that we can think I'll be able to do. Right? Things we can do that I'll never be able to do. You can pick a 30 inch off the ground without bending over. You know what's too thick? 
<laughs> you feel the testosterone rush, guys? Yeah! <laughs> Alright, so anyway, we're back here, and, 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 and you know, we're playing there, great, we get a little bit older, and, and what all, so they, they, they put us into middle school. True confession, I don't even go into middle school. Back in the college junior high. I was the one that thought that was Miss Brandy. I led the national protest. Why is it junior high? Why isn't it senior elementary? <laughs> okay, I settled out of court. Middle school. So you went to middle school. Things were a lot different in the middle school years. Because instead of one class and one teacher, you had a whole bunch of both. In science, you let real bugs and burgers. You dissected real frogs. In gym class, you took real showers. People saw you real and naked bodies. Things were different. Then you got older. You went into high school. Remember, you went from being a senior at the middle school to a freshman in high school, and freshmen always had that look. I have this superpower. I can tell freshmen at high school. They're just this stone-faced look. And all of a sudden, you're a freshman in school, you probably start at 14, 15, 16, 16, four years, and all of a sudden, bang. Here we go, graduate. Four years. Seems like a long time, remember? Now all of a sudden, people are asking us, and answer that question. So what are you going to do with your life? Here it was a commencement. You thought it was a graduation party. Not really is it realizing the commencement didn't mean to end, it means to begin. And now all of a sudden, with all this jam inside our head, we're supposed to come into college, have this kind of a look, and say, <laughs> no. <laughs> so where are you now? On this team, how old are you doing today? I don't have a, my superpower is down here. I can't tell the age, but they look very useful. Thank you. Yeah. How old were you when you graduated from? I was 22. 22, okay, so let's find a 22. So I'm right there. Oh, you're right there. Bingo. Right there. All right, so now we have this time right here, these four years. Assuming, I know there's some people that are like, I get it. I get it. Three years left. All right. Somewhere in here, assuming you fit the college model and you start and finish in four years. I want you to look at that. Sometimes it seems so long. I can remember that deal of drudgery. Talking to my wife this morning. I don't normally talk to high school kids. I mean, college students. It's out of my wheelhouse. Talk to high school students. People that employ young people. This is kind of weird for me. Honest. If I want to see my own mind, I was anybody in there. No, all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, that's what we're supposed to do. That's the way the world or Western culture sees it. We're supposed to be a college when we get out. Right? So somewhere in here, we go from, you know, acting like idiots to professional business world. This period right here that I want to focus on because it seems like so long for four years. And, and so many of us are like, oh, so this is going to take forever. You know what it is? Once again, look inside the frame. Still don't see the picture. But sometimes it just looks like it's going to take forever. School really isn't that long. That's kind of a misrepresentation. Here's why it flies by, because it's not only four years. I mean, four years would mean 365 days of class, but you're not in class 365 days to be average. Academic year. How many days a year are you in class? What would be a fair number? Throw it out. 100. 180. When is 180? Let's use 180. Four times 180 is what? That's right, 720. So, why don't you take your hand and move it right about here? If you would please take your hand and move it right about here. And that's probably closer to 720 if you're, if you're in school 24 hours a day. Because remember, this, this represents our entire life, and that's. 24 hours, you're not in class 24 hours a day, your entire school existence. Class, studying for class, whatever. Honestly, about what percentage of your day, average, does it represent? And don't give me some, oh, I studied all day. <laughs> and, 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 about what percentage of your day? 25? More? 30. 30. Oh, yeah. 30. Third. Third. Let's take 720 days and divide by third. This is about 240 days, which is 7.9 inches. That's the entire college experience. People every single day, every class you're supposed to go to, college. Yes. Don't see it. 
because we're in it. All of a sudden, you wake up someday. And you're no longer 19, 20, 21, 22, but you might be 30 in a month or maybe you're, I don't know, God, you're, you're 42 in a while. <laughs> and you look back and you go, not only where did it go, but what got me where I am? And I'm going to tell you, this one right here has everything to do with what happens out here. Sometimes we blow this off, sometimes we're racing through, sometimes we don't give it its due diligence, sometimes we only go to guest lectures because we get extra credit. God forbid it, you know what that here. Right? We just want to get it over with the race on it. Right? Let's move on down the line. It's out here. This is what happens to us, doesn't it? Someday when we just run in, we can always have these happy things at the end. Office at the corner of you, we have your own company. And the next thing you know, you just wake up and you're like, oh, it just went by so fast. And if I could just, if I could just go back, but the problem is, it's impossible. No, it, it, it's, it's literally impossible. <coughs> Speakers say nothing's impossible. It's impossible. We have not developed a way to go back. It's not going to happen. There's no magical DeLorean that you can crank up to 88 gigawatts and go sailing back to the future and live this time. This is it. This is a one way street and it goes by like that. And the question is how do you make it count? How can you make this count so that out here, all the way we're making, I've been wrestling with that. I've been struggling with that, and I've been trying to help people do that. My life has been one of a, a teacher, a coach, motivational speaker. I mean, I, I taught school, I taught high school business classes. It used to be, you know, this was Colorado Normal School. It was a place that teachers went. Not when I was there. I was at the University of Northern Colorado, but there's still huge majors in education. And I wanted to be a business teacher, so that when I had to do business curriculum, I wanted to teach in school because I wanted to teach high school business courses. That's what I wanted to do, teach and coach. And I did, but I graduated when there weren't a lot of jobs for business teachers. So I taught school for six years. And I was in five different schools in four different districts in two different states. Because the last one hired us, so it was the first one they called fired, they called it weird, reduction in force. Ping pong bounced around. I loved teaching, I hated that. Moving around from place to place, but my whole goal was to help in that school to work transition. Try to help other people figure it out what's going to happen here. Because what you do here has everything to do with what's going to happen here. And while we're there, we're at a convenient stopping point. Help me thank my friends who came up and held the tape measure day. Each and every one of you see me after the program, I got a free book for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You can wind that, you can wind that stuff up. That's just absolutely perfect. Yeah, just leave it there. So, that way, the question that we'd all like to know is how do you get where you want to go? And uh, oftentimes we don't even know where that is. So I've been working with companies and organizations. I first tried to help young people figure it out. And then I started working with companies and organizations who employ young people. Because in between teaching, getting bounced around, and then all of a sudden realizing I don't have a teaching job, I had to do something. I had no idea what I was going to do. I had been bounced around from the final, class, from the final school I was at. I said, i got to do something. I like being in front of young people. And so I figured, why don't I become a motivational speaker? Because kind of credentials doesn't take you to do this job. Thank you. So, you know, that's what I want to say. My parents are printers. Thank you very much. Um, so, I And the brochure just simply said Eric Chester, dynamic motivational speaker for teens. Put a picture on there. I didn't have a speech, but I had a brochure. <laughs> and they nailed it out. Why? Major marketing? Set up. Phone started away. I wound up a motivational speaker for teens. Did you hear me? I had no speech. I had no idea what I was going to say. There I was standing in front of students in gymnasiums. Maybe a very religious man. Because you come into the middle of the gymnasium and they hand you a microphone, you find God real fast. <laughs> First programs didn't go very well. But you can tell. <clears throat> you can tell when you can act. Every once in a while, the students lean forward. And they laugh at one of your lame jokes. And you start putting those pieces together. Before long, I had this speech that burned from end to end. And I began to speak. 
at various high schools throughout the Denver metro area and along the front range in Fort Long, coast to coast and border to border, 1,500 different middle schools and high schools. I was like a silver tongue devil. I mean, you just hand me a microphone, put me in front of it. I was on fire, rocking and rolling. And the same time that Whitney and I were at Walmart and saw that millennial clock, I began to notice there were some changes. That even though I had been at the top of my game, what had once gone at this thunderous standing ovation was then just getting a tepid response, and I wondered what had happened. At the same time, I'm getting asked by businesses and industries, hey, motivate young people, help us. We're really struggling. They don't seem to be the same as we are. They're not playing the game the same way. So I sat back and said, what if I earned the right to stand in front of business people and talk about it? Because you stuff wouldn't go over with it. So I changed the question. What did I earn the right to speak about? I motivated teams. Maybe I could help them motivate teams. And I sat back and I started listening to all the dialogue that was taking place. And the dialogue was all about this generational stuff. People were talking about Gen X. Well, see, I was born between the end of World War II, but prior to the Kennedy assassination, and there was a boom going on. There was a boom in population. There was a boom in patriotism. There was a boom in prosperity. They had no choice but to make it was what? Baby boomers. Oh, the baby boomers. We're at the tail end of the baby boom. And when I started teaching, I realized the students were a little different than me. They were just a few years younger. I was 22. They didn't have hair growing up. I looked like one of the students. I had to show my ID to get into the gymnasium earlier than the students so I could do registration. The first high school, Inglewood High School. It was crazy. I looked at this young kid. And, 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 and yet, even though I looked like him, the students weren't exactly like me. You know how I tried to teach him? The exact same way I was taught. I channeled my own teachers. I remembered how they taught me. I said, I'll just be a version of that. And then went on and I started teaching that way, and I misconnected. That was the first class of Gen X, which we didn't know it at the time. People were referring to them as baby busters, because it was a smaller generation. He demographically was smaller. But baby busters was the only label that came up with. It wasn't until years later until a Canadian wrote a novel about three characters who traveled throughout North America, and his characters broke all the rules. And he simply tied his novel using one letter out of the alphabet. What letter was that? What do you think? What was it? X. X. Hey, you ought to know. Talk about brilliant branding. Because everything we don't understand, we simply label it with an X. X became cool. Look at the car. What are we watching on TV and on ESPN right now? X games on traditional sports. We don't understand. It's mysterious. This was Generation X. They were mysterious. So I was a teacher for Gen X students. When I started speaking, you know, Gen X students in the audience, things changed. I don't think it was an exact birth year. People have called me a demographic, uh, demographer before because I wrote some generational books, and I've since dispelled that notion. See, I think if the child was born on December 31st, 1979 at 11.59 p.m., that kid is not radically different than his twin brother who was born two minutes later. But the demographers would say one is Gen X and one is Gen Y. Because Generation Y was supposed to start in 1980. Millennials, right? Totally different than Gen X. It's not two minutes, it's two days, it's two weeks, it's two years. Here's the deal. Everything in your generations, Give the answer that you have to demographically, but the real response is shared historical perspective. What a child grows up with, they accept or they reject. What they grow up with, that becomes profoundly important to them. Are you all the same because of when you were born? Does everybody believe the same way? Are you going to vote the exact same way in the election? Are you all one way or another? Are you all like the same kind of music because you were born at a certain birth year? Of course not. When you grow up, it's just what impacts us. But yet, there the market was screaming, we don't understand young people. Primarily, we don't understand how to recruit them, how to train them, how to manage, and how to motivate them. So I've written some books for youth. I've uh, written a series of books called Team Power. I've got a couple of those with me today. These were anthology style books. I right. book. I was going to tell teenagers. Is this somebody as a, God forbid, a pager? No, it's a microphone. Oh, it's a microphone. Sorry. Hello, testing. All right, so... Um, I, I, I sat down to write a book because I was talking to all these teams. I said, what if I told them everything I knew? And I sat down and I put together what was a Pulitzer winning manuscript. 12 pages. <laughs> it's not a book. It's not even a book left. It's like, what do I do with this? And then I thought, yeah, but I 
idea. What if I talk to other motivational speakers and have them send me the best 2,500 books? And they started doing that. I called them the best motivational speakers in America and they sent me their stuff. And I took a lot of what I learned that kept them all. We didn't call on for back then, just kept them. A lot of the marketing stuff, and I put together a book and it's called Team Power. And the whole concept was um, I would publish a book, they would send me their chapter, plus a modest fee, and I would publish a book for them. Because most of them didn't know how to put the book together. My parents were printers. It was in my, in my blood. I put together this book, and sold 300,000 of these books, team power. And you know what started happening? It was really hard to get people on board, because most of my speaker buddies looked at it competitively. Oh, well, why will I send you the book? And who else is going to be in it? It took me a while to get the idea. To, I'm not going to have strong with your money. We're going to put something together. Quality, you'll like it, etc. 1995, first time this book was published. You know how long it took me to do this? This is Team Power 2. This has 12 other motivational speakers. They sent their stuff in their checks so fast because once somebody saw that it was happening, the, prime, the pump was prime, and people started sending this, and we did eight editions of this book. We did a Christian version. We did one for middle school kids. We did one for teachers. We did a leadership guide. We went on and on and on. People want to get on board. Everybody wants to be on a plane that's going somewhere. See something? You want to be successful? People start seeing that you're a little bit successful, and they want to see that growth. You're struggling out there. There's some people that they want help. But you don't want to position yourself as somebody who's struggling, and Jesus, I need help. You want to be a person that has a destiny. You know where you're going. So that was Team Power, Team Power 2. So I understood the publishing process, and I put together a, a proposal so that I could get selected by a major publisher. And my goal was to write a book on the new generation, because everyone was just talking about Generation X, and I knew it had changed. Some people were throwing out the word Generation Y. It's in the letter that follows X. I'm thinking, Jesus, we're going to call generations after letters in the alphabet. We started a little late. <laughs> So it didn't seem to work, so I had to brand myself. So I wrote a book, and I couldn't get it published. I wound up self-publishing this book. This was called Employing Generation Y, W-H-Y. Understanding, managing, and motivating your new workforce. You know what I did? I went out, I worked with companies and organizations. I found out what the biggest challenge was. When you listen to the market, you pay attention to what they want. You deliver what they want in a way that's true and authentic and what you believe in. You create a brand. People like this brand, and it works. So the next thing you know, I started getting interviewed on major media. You know, people were like paying attention. It was a self-published book because you run into blockades. People go, you're not from the right school. You're not from the right fabric. You don't have the right experience. What well, gives you the right to write the book? And what you have to do is tune out those voices and say, I feel confident. I can do this. I'm going to get it done. Don't let obstacles stand in your way. I'm sure that's nothing new to you. I decided I was going to do it no matter what. Produced a book, and I had this one self-published, but I wanted it to make it look like a Simon & Schuster book. So I surrounded myself with the best people in the industry, the best book designers, you know, copy editors, etc. And we put a book together that I'm still incredibly proud of. The problem was, and this is, by the way, my son of the front cover who happens to be 27 years of age, he's going to graduate state back when he was a senior in high school, and he's standing in front of a cash register that says 1980, because Generation Y was theoretically in existence in 1980, and Zach, of course, born later, he was born in 85, but wanted to show that, well, wait a second, there's some relevance here. So understanding, managing, and motivating your new workers, I had to pay Zach to get the photo of your face. It's crazy. But anyway, um, he's maybe more of a marketer than I. But anyway, I created this, this, this book and this brand, and it seemed to go. Companies and organizations were calling like crazy. How in the world do we end up like Paul Revere? Riding up and down the streets, and there's a new generation coming, there's a new generation coming, people are listening. They don't think like you. Well, they're into technology, and by golly, they, 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 they don't want to wait for an annual performance review. They play video games, they want to know instant, instantly how well they've done, et cetera, et cetera. And here, what I'm talking about, I'm talking about you. Or maybe your older brothers and sisters. Because this has an expiration date. Generation B. And I wrote it for a while. And now all of a sudden, is it still Generation Y? Still millennials? Do you like being pigeonholed? Most people don't. And the problem has come from what businesses tell me is this thing you call work ethic. You hear your generation being entitled a lot, entitled. Do you hear that? Is that rubbing the wrong way? How many people in here feel like they're entitled? I don't see any hands. Driving nuts when they say entitled. You know what they're saying? They're saying people have demands. They go into the workplace and they expect to start at the top. And 
and that they've got a college degree, so that all of a sudden we should change our rules for them, etc. Here's what I would think. If I knew and I hear that, I'm busting that stereotype. Anything they think I'm going to be, I'm not going to be that. Because then all of a sudden we stand out. The bad news is, you talk to most employers, and they will say, this generation is in time. The good news is, it doesn't take that much to stand above the crowd. In doing my homework for this program today, I talked to a couple of Longford School business leaders and professors. You know one of the challenges they see is? You guys don't know how good you are. Really? You are really. Longford School of Business, UNC. And they lack a little bit of confidence. Fortunately, I talk to the CU, they think they're better than they are. The reality is, you get in this world exactly what you think you're worth. That doesn't mean you come in and act entirely, but that means take pride in the work that you do and know that this is one of the most respected institutions in business across the country. People are looking at law for school business. This is not an easy place to get in, into or to get out, regardless whether you're in a big town or a small town. It just really doesn't matter. So, back to this deal. Okay, so employing Generation Y. This brand had some life, it had some legs, it grew, speaking, lecturing, selling books on the media, it seemed to work. And then all of a sudden something happened in 2008. You know, it was in September when the stock market took this huge dip in the housing bubble and all the Wall Street mess. And the first thing the companies do when, they're not, when, when uh, the economy hits the skids, they cut two things. They cut advertising and they cut meetings. So companies that used to do a five-day meeting were now just doing a three-day meeting instead of bringing in five outside external speakers. Now they might bring in two, maybe one. A lot of companies are saying, we don't really need to meet this year, maybe we'll meet next year or every other year. And maybe you remember the catastrophe from, way up from AIG and Wells Fargo and all the financial institutions because they would take these incentive trips that were largely educational, but they had some components that were you know, lavish, where people would go on golf tournaments and they get to go to fancy places and you know what they started doing? They said, well, now there's this perception and if the public sees that these banking executives are going on some kind of a retreat and staying at the Four Seasons and, and in Palm Springs, what are they doing with my money? And the company said, we're not going to do that anymore. And so meetings and professional speakers were devastated. My brand, probably more so than others, because I went from being this hot guy on Generation Y, and now people were saying, hey, guess what? They're not hard to recruit or train anymore. Because now we've got stacks of applications on our desk and nobody's leaving their job. So my business was cut and cut again, and I had to stand back and once again and ask, what is the market really struggling with? And years of research, listening in the trenches, I'm not an academic. I don't read the research and I don't listen to the statistics. Because oftentimes that comes from, I don't know, surveys. I said, I just, I don't trust that. I trust the anecdote. What's happening? How do you feel in your world? What's going on? And I, being an in the trenches guy, not only with youth, but with business leaders, said, what's the biggest issue you're struggling with? In time when, but I boiled down to this term, work ethic. Baby boomers are famous for work ethic. They talk about surveys. Pew Research did a, re did a big exhaustive study and they asked people of various generations what they most identified with. When it came to work ethic, baby boomers listed that as the number one characteristic that their generation identified with. Your generation didn't even make the top ten. It was music, fashion, and, and being a uh, tolerant of other people and different work. It's important. Is it the most important thing? And so I came back and started explaining to business leaders, rather than blame them, understand maybe this is a generation that hasn't been victims of work. Because people on the age man, it's all we do. Think about your parents. They get up and they go to work, they come home and they go to work, they talk about work at the dinner table, if there is a dinner table. Bring work on vacation with them, right? Always talking about work, always completely consumed with work, and as a result, true statistic, average parent three to five minutes a day in meaningful dialogue with their son and daughter. I'm not talking about 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the performance-based command. So I go clean your room. Did you do your homework? Take out the trash. I'm talking about meaningful dialogue, three to five minutes a day. Same kid will spend between five and seven hours a day in front of a screen. And you know what kind of screen? Video game screen, iPod screen, iPad screen. You know, screen to what we grow up with, we accept, we reject what we grow up with. That becomes profoundly important to us. Guess what? Generation Y, whatever you want to be called, have been a victim of Have we spent the time with our kids that we needed to spend? Take them to lack of places. I never got to go anywhere when I was there. I mean, I left the state for the very first time when I was 17 years of age. I'd never been outside the state of Colorado. I'd never been on an airplane until I was 22. I mean, I never got to travel very much. I mean, you know, we had an Airstream trailer that my dad was probably 20 years older than, that it was 20 years old when he bought it, and we just would spend our whole summers fixing it up, and finally about Labor Day weekend, it might be good enough to take down the Monument Lake Resort. I grew up in the Denver metro area, which is about 49 miles down the highway. There was a little RV park down there, and we might get to spend a weekend if the trailer didn't break down on the way there. And that's how I, I grew up. I didn't know. I didn't. My kids have been everywhere. What do you think? You work so hard, so all of a sudden you can take a weekend off and go someplace fabulous, and while you're there, maybe you're talking on your phone, and shh, 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 I'll be with you in a while. You know what I'm telling you is actually painful? It's not I'm talking about somebody else, I'm talking about myself. You have four wonderful kids, but in that process, how much time do you really spend teaching you the values that maybe I grew up with when it was so important to my father? You know, our parents have never set foot on the college campus when I started here in Lindsay. Never set foot on the college campus, ever. And I went in for 40 years, and they never set foot on this campus. My parents didn't come up here and tour the place with me. I was like, where are you going to go to school? I thought of my own college applications. I said, and they were so proud. I had four sisters, two older, two younger. None of them went to school. I was the first. Now I'm going to go to school. My dad's going to be so proud. Tenth grade education, PhD in life. I'll tell you one thing, man. He valued education. His son was going to go to college by golly. Didn't care what I majored in, because someday I was going to have a college degree, and then all of a sudden we would be business owners together. He even drew out business cards that said, Grant Chester and Sons. Grant Chester and Sons, what? It didn't matter. We were going to be in business together because I had a college education. I don't know how many of you have similar stories, but I can guarantee you this. Companies and organizations out there right now are struggling with this work ethic. And so I went looking for the book. Where's the book that talks about work ethic and developing work ethic? You know, there hasn't been a book written on work ethic in over a hundred years. Last book on work ethic was 1904. We don't, we talk about work ethic, they complain about it, but there wasn't a book. And you know what I saw? Business students. Marketing opportunity. No book on work ethic. Maybe all right. Spent the last 18 months writing a book called <coughs> Reviving work ethic. This just came out earlier this month. Reviving work ethic. And of course, understanding their pain, a leader's guide to any entitlement and restoring pride in the emerging workforce. Ask what the market wants and give them what they want, as long as you're true to yourself. This does not bash your generation in any stretch or form. It just basically says there are things that we can do culturally to change companies and organizations to model a work ethic as opposed to just standing back saying, you come in here and you better have a work ethic. So let me ask you a question. If you were asked what work ethic is, is there anybody in here that says, I don't have a good work ethic? Anyone in the company, I have a crappy work ethic. Again, nobody! Huh. So if I asked you to define it, how would you define it? Yes? Discipline, accountability, responsibility. Responsibility, accountability. <laughs> I like that. Anybody else? Adjectives. Well, it's just conversation. This isn't a speech. If you don't understand, I am not in a speech right here. This is a conversation. Right? So help me out. What else? Dedication. Dedication. Perseverance. Perseverance. Diligence. Diligence. Drive. Drive. Quality. What was that? Quality. Quality. Okay. Would that be pride? Quality, pride, taking pride. Yep. Really interesting. Would that be hard? I'm sorry. Integrity. Integrity. You know, I love The first thing is when there's a term like work ethic out here and people are talking about it, what is defining, what does that really mean? Because <coughs> someday someone's going to question or pray to your work ethic. They're going to question it or they're going to praise it, and maybe it'll be both. 
I said, when you start talking about work ethic, what does it really mean? Well, here's what I did. There's no book on work ethic. Uh, we banner it about. You can look it up on Wikipedia and see what somebody else thinks. But you know when I start defining work ethic, what, what I see? If you look up the two words, work. What is Work is an activity. Work is doing something. Work is something that you do. Right? What's ethic? Ethic is knowing, feeling, a belief. What is work ethic? Knowing what to do and doing it. Knowing what to do and doing it. That's work ethic. So I think it's just putting in long hours. So would I have a good work ethic if I was hired here and, uh, and I saw this board and I just sit up here and I spent 12 hours a day just trying to get this off me? 12 hours. 14 hours. At what time would you say he has a good work ethic? Because I'm putting in a lot of hours. So is work ethic just about the hours that you put in? Or maybe some of the words that you just threw out. So I went to employers once again and I said, what do you want? What do you want from young employees? 1,500 different managers asking that question. Now, they could be managers at a subway. It could be a CEO of a company like Harley Davidson. What are you looking for? What are you hiring? I know what you think. I know what you think. Fancy resumes, great interviewing skills. Let's put down a list of what we can do. A lot of people think that. Here's what I heard. Over and over and over again. I'm going to paraphrase if you don't mind. Over and over again. Who are positive, enthusiastic people who show up for work on time? Prepared properly. People who will play by our rules. Go above and beyond the call of duty. <coughs> people who we can trust. And who know something about certs. I'll say that again. Positive, enthusiastic people who show up for work on time and dressed and prepared properly. People who will play by our rules. Who will go above and beyond the call of duty. Who we can trust. People know a little something about service. So I was playing Trivia Pursuit a couple of weekends ago. You know what we're doing is we're that, that, that if you play Trivia Pursuit, or if you understand the game, you get this little like a, a piece of a little pie game, and as you lay on spaces and answer questions, they give you a little piece and you stick it in there. And what we're trying to do is fill up our pie. Think about what you're doing right here at UNC right now. You know what you're trying to do? A piece of pie. College degree. Right? College degree, it's an experience. I just keep putting these little pieces of pie in. And someday I'll be able to take that pie and I'll go to an employer, even if I want to work for myself. I'll go somewhere because if I want to work for myself, I'll probably need some capital and I need to go to a bank. And I gotta show them what it's pie. And in the process, we're trying to collect those pieces of pie. Do you know what business leaders have told me? We'll put the pieces of pie in. Bring us, bring us that mold. That's that work ethic. We, 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 we're not sitting here asking if somebody can drive a forklift or program in JavaScript. That's not on the list. What they're asking for is positive, enthusiastic people who will show up on time, dressed and prepared properly. People who will go above and beyond the call of duty, people who will play by the company's rules, who they can trust, and who know something about service. Now, I alliterated those in this book called the reviving organ, because I wanted to give simple terms to those things, and I used some of the exact same terms that you just threw out, by the way, those were great, great adjectives to find the work out. Here's, use seven words. Seven words became seven chapters. If you want positive, enthusiastic people work until people with attitude, what is that? Is there anyone that hasn't gotten a lecture from, been lectured to death from the time you were knee-high to a pimple on the fleece butt about the importance of having a positive attitude. Don't you hear that all the time? you got to have a positive attitude. What does that mean? I mean, think about it. Next time somebody says, hey, I don't like your attitude. Are you supposed to just go? <laughs> Isn't it ridiculous? I hear so many people, you got to change your attitude. You change. How do you change your attitude? All right, motivational speaker, let me tell you what an attitude is. Attitude is nothing more than a pair of glasses that you put on the way that you see the world. It's the way you see the world, it's the way you see yourself, it's the way you see yourself in this world. That's your attitude. And you do have a choice. Every day you have a choice the way you see this world. That's your positivity or your negativity. Yes, you see the glass half full or half empty. You can't change it by the way you look at it. But what you do about it, you have everything to deal with. And companies, organizations, managers want people who are at least enthusiastic. That's not Pollyannish. That's not ignoring problems. That's not somebody who just has a peace and own smile on their face. But we want to be around people who have a degree of positivity, who have a feeling, have emotion, are, are, are looking for solutions to problems. 
People who aren't going to sit there and, and bring the organization down, the company down, the workforce, the team down with a bunch of idle gossip and shit. One of the true statements I've ever heard is you are going to be, in the next five years, what you are today, with the exception of the books you read and the people you associate with. And how many times do we associate ourselves with people who complain, moan, like, just are bitter about certain things because they they happen to be funny. Look at most of the sitcoms on TV. Sit down sometimes and watch a sitcom. I don't care what it is. Two and a half men watch the new one with the two waitress girls or whatever. Watch any sitcom that you do and sit back and say, every time you laugh, there's a laugh line. Is it because they just made fun of somebody? They just slam somebody? It becomes funny. And it gets ingrained in our sight. So we tend to look at how can we complain, moan, gripe, find the stupid thing, what do we do? What happens when we come into a classroom? Where do we have to be here? Where do we want to sit? I don't have to go through this because I've got to get this piece of pie. I've got to get this list signed. This is class. Nobody likes class. Nobody likes college. Why are we here? What's the relevance? What's the importance? They have no idea what my life is all about. And what do we tend to do? We tend to try to sit towards the back. You know, as a teacher, I could always tell which students were going to excel in my class because they sat in the T. The T was they sat in the middle, they sat towards the front. They leaned forward and they were prepared. The problem is it's easy to teach to the T and motivated learners. You start talking about a topic and they're already researching. And then you have people who sit in the outskirts who are like, you know, I don't really dig this. It's not, I'm just here just to get that little piece of pie and move on. And I got it, you know, I was probably that kind of student when I was here. My dad wants me to get a college education on B. And there was very little relevance, oftentimes, from some of the subject matter I was learning and what I really wanted to do with my life. But, you know, I started out not to be a business teacher when <laughs> I came to UNC. My goal was to be the next Howard Cosell. Show of hands. How many people even know who Howard Cosell is? Most of you don't. Howard Cosell was one of the Monday night football broadcast announcers. He was an overbearing guy that, he wasn't an athlete, but he was an amazing announcer. So he was there with Fred Giver, first couple of seasons of Monday Night Football, was headed to all the boxing matches. If you ever watch the old Muhammad Ali clips, he's always the guy with the big ears that's interviewing Muhammad Ali. He was everywhere. He was ubiquitous. And you know something? I identified with that. I wanted to be Howard Cosell because I could talk and I liked sports. I just wasn't a good enough athlete. But I figured it out. And it's got to know his weaknesses. But I could talk about sports. I know what I'll be. I'll be a sportscaster. I listened to a few people and said, look, you're going to be a sportscaster, you've got to study journalism. My first class here in this building was journalism, 101. It was a, the floor below us at the end of the hall. I walked in there, and everybody was sitting there with a book called Elements of Style, and they were sitting behind typewriters typing. That was a joke. <coughs> I had never typed before. I didn't know. So I, 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 I didn't know how to type, and these guys were going, they were writing stories, and, and so I went and I told, the instructor, I, I, I don't know how to type. He said, well, then you better drop this class and take a typing class. I went down and I changed my major. Uh, I don't know how to type. I, I guess I'm not going to be a, a journalist. Somebody said, well, you can get there if you take communications. Oh, get another piece of pie. Go get a communications degree. Go ahead and start majoring in communications. I, I don't even know if they have any more of the library. Uh, uh, communications. Uh, is it Michigan? Uh, Kendall Leary. Did you still have Kendall Leary yet? He didn't task in a long time. I had Kendall Leary at all. I go to the communications class. Everyone's going to sit around at Artsy Parkey talking about some weird crap. I'm like, this is not me. I'm not that guy. I go home and I tell my dad, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know what he said? Hey, he was like that DECA program you were in school, that marketing program. I should be one of those teachers. The dad would be proud of me if I, was a, if I was a business teacher. He said, yeah. I can't even change my nature again. It's like boom, boom, boom. Why? Because it's just very influential. What do I do? I just got to get this piece of mind. I just got to race through it. So half the time, thinking I was going to be a business teacher and I knew how to talk well, I would just learn a little bit about that. I wasn't going to teach forever. I was going to be a millionaire. I'm 25. I don't know what it was, but I'd create some kind of an idea. These things were going through my head. So guess what? Half the time I was sitting in class, I was fighting the instructor. I don't want to listen to what you have to say. I really don't want to be here. This isn't the class for me. I'm fighting it all the way through. Just what do I need to do so I can get the grade, get that piece of pie, and move on down the road? Do you know how many times I've regretted that over the past 32 years? Even the classes I didn't think I needed, now it's just, wow, I wish I would have to pay attention. Sometimes your kids ask you questions you don't know. I'm never a scientific guy. And I had to take a, a, a couple of science classes, you know, you know core classes. I don't know science. It's not going to be what I do. So my son, Zach, I mean, I remember he's four years of age, and he asked me, Dad, how's it rain? I told him two clouds bang together. I don't know. I'm going to tell you something, guys. I'm just revealing. It just, you don't think you know until you need to know. You go back. 
So what does all this have to do with attitude? It's the way you approach what you do every single day. And your attitude isn't going to someday magically change. If you assessed yourself and looked back and said, is this the person I want to hang around with? Is this how I want to approach this class, this day, this assignment, this task, this project? If I were teaching, would I, sit to, would I want people to sit towards the front, lean forward, and get involved? What I want them to do, if that's the way you're putting if you're assessing yourself and saying, yes, guess what? You're on the right track. And if the answer is no, you're not going to magically get out here somebody and have this take your shirt off. Bam! Now I have a positive attitude. It just gets worse. The good news is you can control it. Attitude number one. Second value in that book is reliability. They say they want people to show up on time. It doesn't matter how talented you are. Your company or organization will not value you unless they can rely on you. Unless they know you're going to be there. What's your reliability record now? Would you be in this room if you didn't have to sign that list? Think about that. And it's not just about this particular class. It's about all your classes. Are you reliable? When we say, I've got your back, we want to know somebody's got our back. We all want to associate with people who, quote, have our back. Have our back 50% of the time, 80% of the time. If you look at your attendance record in school, would it be one you hold up to a future employer and say, see, look, I was here 92% of the time. I was in class. If you were on my airplane and I was your pilot, and I announced over the loudspeaker, ladies and gentlemen, I've done 2,000 flights, and 92% of the time, I have landed safely. <laughs> If I was your anesthesiologist and you're going to come in and get an operation, get your appendix out, right? That operation is going to take place at 7 o'clock that morning. Are you kidding me if I show up like at 7 one? You know what I do. You better be here early. Because I don't want them to come in and then you put me out. So a minute late matters. That's what your employers want from you. People that want you on their team want to know, I've got you 100% of the time. I don't give a flying fuck lot if there was traffic. I don't care if, 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 if I, I mean, I care that your kid has the flu, but you know, that's not my problem. That's not my issue. You need to be here. You need to be here on time. Plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Are you reliable? 100% reliable. You start looking at your watch maybe at 2.30 in the afternoon, well, okay, what time do we get out of here? Why don't you spend some seat time? Are you really there? That's what they're looking for. Plus, enthusiastic people were reliable, were there on time. Third thing, dressed appropriately. So let me ask you a question. If I wasn't speaking here today and I was just working around my office, would I be dressed like this? Answer no. I'd probably be dressed like you. Seriously. My business partner is Josh here. Josh, do I have a ball cap on backwards and come in with like, ah, this isn't what I want to wear. How would you perceive me? If I walked in with a ball cap on backwards and pair of sweats on me, you might say that you don't judge. See, the reality is we all judge. And when we say don't judge me, we don't mean that. We mean judge me favorably. So here what employers are arguing with. According to the American Dermatological, according to skin doctors. <laughs> I never use that word. Say, according to skin doctors, 35, 48% of all people under the age of 35. Again, here I am just about a statistic, but 48% of all people under the age of 35 have a body piercing or a tattoo somewhere other than their ear bone. Quick survey. How many people in here have a tattoo or a piercing other than their ear bone for Okay? You know what employers are saying? We don't care what you do on your personal time, but man, if you're representing us, you might say, well, wait a second, you don't know me inside. You don't know who I am inside. Imagine me trying to pass that over to you if I came today and I'm dressed with a ball cap on backwards and a flannel shirt and a pair of, you know, sweatpants on. Hey, don't judge me. Of course you're going to judge me. Right? It's just what we do. And companies say, well, we want you to be yourself, but we, when you represent us, you've got to look like us. Imagine that anesthesiologist that shows up like at 7 o'clock right before you go into an operation. And you're sitting there going, I'm the most open, tolerant person in the world. And then you can meet your anesthesiologist because your eyes are open on the operating table. All of a sudden he looks over at you and you realize the anesthesiologist has blue spiked hair, about 14 earrings in their ear, a big nose piercing, and a tattoo on their forehead that says life is overrated. 
<laughs> and here comes your oxygen mask. What do you do? I'm out of there. Why? Because you judge. And we all judge. And your employer wants you to look like a professional. Not just on the day that you interview, every single day. How do you represent yourself? How do you represent the company? It's more than just appearance. Am I prepared? Am I ready to go? I spoke at a high school staff development program a couple of weeks ago. You know what the teacher was telling me? God, it's, the kids, the students have been showing with a pencil and a piece of paper. I spend half my time just going, okay, we're going to take notes today. And they act super shocked. Like they, oh, God, does anybody have a pencil, piece of paper and a pencil? The company is like people are prepared. Are you ready? <laughs> Are you there on time? I think LeBron shows up at 7 o'clock at tip-off time. But he's there a couple hours ahead of time because at 7 o'clock it's go time. That's what company employers want. Positive, enthusiastic people show up for work on time, prepared, or, as my book would say, attitude, reliability, and professionalism. There are silos. What you do in your personal life is your personal life. What you do on their time is your professional life. They don't want you checking Facebook. They don't want you texting. That's the biggest fear. Oh, what do we do? What do we do? Show up for an interview. Would you get an opportunity to interview? And they say, what are your strengths? I'll tell you one thing. I know my personal and my professional time is you will never catch any texting or checking my Facebook company as long as I have company time. And you know what they're going to do? Really? You might get hired just because of that. I'm telling you the truth. They're looking for people who understand. Well, we're, we're always connected. No, when I'm here, I'm connected to my work. I will use the tools that you give me and the way that you, you, you want them to be used. I won't abuse my privileges. When I'm on company time, when I'm here, when I'm working for you, you get 100% of me. That, not just saying it, doing it, believing it, that's going to take, that, that's going to get you noticed. Positive, reliable, <coughs> professional, initiative. How many times people have told me, I do the job I'm paid to do. Maybe you've had part-time jobs and you felt the same way. Well, I get eight bucks an hour. Don't expect me to crank out two bucks an hour. You know what I say to people like that? You're fired. I can't hire you at eight bucks an hour, or ten bucks an hour, or a hundred dollars an hour, and have you do a hundred dollars an hour worth of work for me. I go broke. You need to produce a two hundred dollars an hour if I'm going to pay you a hundred bucks an hour. And if I pay you eight bucks an hour, you better produce it sixteen dollars an hour. That's the only, by the time I subtract that, your payroll taxes, your training, all the costs that it is to, you've got to make me money. That means you've got to overproduce somebody else, and that boils down to one word. It's called initiative. It's called finding value. Finding and creating value in what you do. Joshua Thomas. Got it. Finding and creating value in what you do. How critically important is that? And some of us don't get it. We just turn around and go, well, I've done everything that they've required of me. People who can add value go above and beyond. Employers are not looking for somebody who can do the minimum data requirement or do the job. We don't want someone to do the job. We want them to excel at the job. So as you begin to prepare your resumes, your applications, you're going to go out and separate yourself from the crowd. How are, you going to put, uh, how are you going to verify to your employers that you were given this task and you can deliver it at this level and every single time? That's what you call it, prospects. We're in an advertising class and we're going to come up with a campaign and we're working with five people and all of a sudden we're looking going, you're not doing your share. You know, we want to work with the person who does their share more. Who's not worried about what everybody else is doing? Just producing, producing, producing. And those become habits. And habits you take with you no matter where you go. When you do a job, you sign your name to it. My dad taught me that. You know my very first job? I grew up in Wheat Ridge. I don't know how many people know where Wheat Ridge is. I grew up in Denver. I grew up in Wheat Ridge. I wanted a car when I was 16 years of age. Dad wasn't going to buy me a car. I mean, I, I grew up in the house. Dad wasn't just going to hand me the car because I turned 16. And it, 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 and I had to find a job that was close enough to the house that I could work or ride my bike so I could get this job. And then a basket on was like an obvious solution because I liked ice cream and I could meet the chicks. <laughs> I went and applied to Baskin Robbins in 1973. I had 16 years of age. You know, I had work before, I had paper route jobs, I washed dishes under the table. This is the first time I applied for jobs. I went and applied for jobs. You know what they said? We're not hiring. I went home and told my dad, Dad, you gotta buy me a car, I'm not hiring Baskin Robbins. Dad saw that as a learning opportunity. So this time we had a little talk. It turned out to be more of a shared monologue. He dismissed my sisters from the table and he sat down and he recanted his childhood. I had heard the story a number of times. This one, this time, he just sank in. My dad was a depression era baby. His father passed away when he was 12 years of age. He was raised in Raleigh, North Carolina, and when he was 16 years of age, there wasn't enough food to feed the family in the house. 
father's gone, textile mills closed down, mom isn't making enough money, my dad had to drop out of school in 10th grade to find odd jobs just to survive. Two years later, he just knew there was a better place to live in Mali. So he sold all his worldly possessions and he heard of this magical place, only seen a movie about it and thought, that's what I want to live in my life, Chicago, Illinois. So he took a three-day bus ticket a three-day bus trip using all the money that he had saved and from selling everything that he had to get from Raleigh, North Carolina, to Chicago, Illinois. Steps off the bus. And we're going to tell me the day. January 21st, 1939. My dad's 18 years of age. He has a nickel in his pocket and the clothes on his back. He steps off that bus at the intersection of Michigan Avenue and Wacker Drive full of hope and optimism. Instead of finding all the dreams he saw people huddle around trash cans and then set on fire just to keep their hands warm. Long bread lines and any mention of the job drew a hundred times as many candidates as there were positions available. And uh, he had to learn to survive. And he was going to make damn sure his son knew how to fight work, even though Baskin Robbins wasn't hiring. So he just can't go into Baskin Robbins. He's like, got nothing better to do. It's like it's one of many jobs you're applying for. You've got to go and solve their problems. I made mean, a terrible mistake. I said, how do I do that? Because I want you to do about another hour's worth of conversation. <laughs> like, we well, got to stand out. you got to understand Baskin Robbins. You've got to understand the science of making ice cream. you got to realize who owns that Baskin Robbins, what that problems are. You've got to go and solve those problems. So I did my homework. Did everything my dad said over the next couple of days. At the end of the week, I go back into Baskin Robbins. This time I asked Mr. Alvin Harrison. Mr. Harrison was the franchise partner. Did my own. Mr. Harrison comes to the front counter. Hello, Mr. Harrison, my name is Eric Chester. I'm here to scoop ice cream for you to delight your customers and improve your profits. He took a step back and grabbed me an application. Maybe he thought I was going to go home. I was ready. I brought a pen and a clipboard. <laughs> I sat down in the lobby. I filled that thing out its entirety when I was done. It was like a Picasso. Names, dates, references. I was ready to go. Handed it back to Mr. Harrison. He's over here doing it. I said, Mr. Harrison, obviously we need to talk about these opportunities in an interview, sir. So, okay, kid, what time you get out of school? I said, 3 o'clock. He goes, good, why don't you come back tomorrow around 4? I was there at 3.45, and my dad said, if you're on time, you're 15 minutes late. I came to work, to that interview, wearing a tie. A tie's a working basket around the skin he'd ever seen that before. It doesn't take that much to stand out. I came alone. I did not bring my posse. He invited me back to his office. It was just a closet, like a storage place with a table and two chairs. And I stood. He told me I didn't to sit. And I sat down and my dad's words were echoing in my head. Don't let your shoulder blades touch the back of that chair. You lean forward, you put a smile on your face, you begin to answer all his questions with complete enthusiastic responses. Yes, Mr. Harrison, absolutely, Mr. Harrison. No job is too big or too small, Mr. Harrison. I'm the man for that job, Mr. Harrison. And that's just when he asked me where I lived. So I moved in for the kill. I had memorized the process of making ice cream. I memorized all 31 flavors, alphabetically. <laughs> I knew his opening hours, I knew what car he drive, I knew where parking spaces were, I knew everything about that job. And I said, obviously, Mr. Harrison, I'm going to scoop ice cream for you to delight your customers and improve your profits. I need to be on the schedule. When do I start, sir? He spun his chair and he grabbed the schedule off the back wall and said, can you come tomorrow? I, 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 gave, I went home. My mom gave me a celebration meal. She picked up the phone. She called my father and came home 20 minutes early for work. Met me in the driveway. Picked me up like a sack of potatoes. Whirled me around and said, that's a chip off the old block. And with his hand on my shoulder, he said, and if you get by it, don't come home. <laughs> He said, you got to be there, you got to be there on time, you got to do what he says, no matter what it is. When he says jump, you say how high. You know what he was saying? Take ambition and play by his rules. The next value is respect. Respect for culture. Right? You don't like the rules, it doesn't matter. Work there for a while and slowly but surely see if you can make an impact. But there your employer, er, e, employer, employee, remember that. Two more values, and we're almost out of time. Honest. How many people call in for work for call in sick for work when they're not sick? How many people fudge on their expense report because you know they lost the receipt, they didn't turn it in, but if they go ahead and just change it just slightly, then it will all come due in the mail. You know what it is? Reality is, companies are saying we can't trust people. Well, 
we, we don't know if you're telling us the truth. But what they really got were people that are 100% honest 100% of the time. You can't be kind of honest just like you can't be kind of proud. The problem is, so many of us have found loopholes. We've found ways. Sign me in. I don't know that thing. Just put, just, just put, in, put an X on my name. Hey, say we did this. He wants to make his 20 calls. That's ridiculous. Way too much. Just tell him we made 20 calls. We made 10. It's okay. Come on, everybody does. The problem is, oftentimes we start, and then we lose ourselves in that process. We start saying one thing and we mean something else, and we lose ourselves in the process. Companies are looking for people they can trust 100% of the time. Don't wait until you're out there to become that, that individual. Hold yourself to that standard there. And last but not least, gratitude. Gratitude is, is different than attitude. And, and, and the, the way I put it in my book, I didn't use the word gratitude. Uh, I did use the word gratitude because it's an active demonstration of attitude. Attitude is the way you feel inside. Gratitude is how I show you. Am I going to go out of my way for you? Customer service is huge black hole in America. Regardless of what company, organization, position you tend to hold, prove that you know something about customer service, that you're there to delight people. And no job is too big or too small. You're going to go out of your way to put, bring a smile on somebody else's face. You're there to serve. You can give that rich call and that Nordstrom feeling to any company, any organization. And if you're not dealing with external customers, how are you treating people in your company in your organization? That's an outward demonstration of being <coughs> having gratitude. Work ethic is knowing what to do and doing it. And it's marked by those seven things. Positivity, reliability, professionalism, initiative, respect, integrity, and gratitude. Now I realize we're just about out of time. We passed out bookmarks to people. Why? Because I'm still working with students who are trying to figure out how to create programs. love that, don't you? So I created this program called Bring Your A-Game to Work. I now have a team that uh, is working with me. We found that the Center for Work Ethic Development and the Bring Your A-Game to Work program is a, is a program to teach the emerging workforce the values that employers want. The Reviving Work Ethic is a program that teaches employers and leaders how to create a culture that makes people want to live up to those values. So the Center for Work Ethic Development does both things. The Bring Your A Game to Work program takes those same seven fundamental values and alliterates them with the letter A so they get easy to remember, but they're the same ones. That's why if you were one of the individuals who got a bookmark, if you're not I'm happy to, 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 to give one to you if, if we have any left, or make sure that you get one, but you can go to the A Game and find out more about that program if you're interested. Here's the, the, the deal. I'm not here to sell you a darn thing, except your future. I can tell you it goes by pretty fast. And that you don't have to wait until you're all of a sudden out there. Somewhere in this back right here, you begin to work on that core values. These are things that you do. They become the person that you are. And what you practice becomes you. You don't all of a sudden say, you know what, I'm going to be a person of integrity in this situation. You say, I'm going to be a person of integrity. I'm, I'm going to be reliable 100% of the time. Every employer, if I'm repping in real sports, I will be there ahead of time. If I tell somebody I'm going to have a project, it's going to be the first. I'm not going to wait to the deadline. I'm not going to cram the night before a test just so I can do the test. I'm going to learn the material so when the test happens, I'm ready to go. Those are the values that companies and organizations are looking for. Find proof in your life that you can demonstrate those things. I can guarantee you, no matter where you want to go, companies out there with open arms saying, we're just embracing those kind of people. Josh, Klein, Zero time. You guys have been awesome. I'm going to stick around. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have in the video.